Hello everybody, I'm Nicholas Snow. Welcome to a very special edition of Notes from Hollywood on Promo Homo TV. In this episode, we'll be discussing the powerful new Surviving the Silence documentary, which tells the untold story of two women in love who helped change military policy. Um, before I get to more about today's episode and this powerful film and my guest and, in fact, the movie's trailer, um, I just want to say that I've been coming out of the closet for about 37 years and Notes from Hollywood started initially as a column in 1990. And when I watch documentaries that have anything to do with the LGBTQ civil rights movement across the decades, one of the things that I realize is that it comes down to zero or one degree of separation between people that have gone out and really changed the world. By the way, if you're tuning into this broadcast as the result of seeing me on Eye on the Desert today on Fox and ABC, Welcome. I couldn't be more excited. This is the first mainstream media attention that the Promo Homo TV network has received. So I'm thrilled about that. Now on to the subject matter of today's show from survivingthesilence.com. In 1992, Colonel Pat Thompson was a decorated army nurse only two years away from retirement she was asked to preside over the military review board that eventually dismissed Colonel Margareta Kammermeyer for admitting she was a lesbian. Although Thompson had served her country with distinction for over 30 years, from conflict zones in Central America to working inside the Pentagon, that appointment perhaps was the hardest. In that moment, she had to protect her own life secret, that she too was a lesbian and living privately with her life partner, Barbara Brass, for many years. At the time, the story of Kammermeyer made national headlines, fueled in part by President Clinton's push to allow gays and lesbians to serve openly in the military. In 1995, Kammermeyer published a successful memoir, Serving in Silence, which was further adapted into a made-for-TV movie, executive produced by Barbara Streisand and starring Glenn Close. Yet Thompson's part in the story remained a secret until 2013 when she and Barbara, now married, decided to go public for the very first time at a college speaking engagement in Northern California. Much to their delight, that speech received a resounding standing ovation, empowering them on their unfolding journey as out and proud lesbians who are visibly committed to using their unique life experience in pursuit of social justice and activism. By chance, Cindy L. Abel was also in the audience, a filmmaker, that night, and she was touched deeply by Pat and Barbara's courage. She knew instinctively that a compelling film about their specific journey could serve as the capstone narrative on a truly national story that most Americans might perceive as a closed chapter from the 1990s. From there, Abel began the work of filming Pat and Barbara's love story under the banner Surviving the Silence, a project which also inspired them to co-author their own memoir. Abel's film is her latest feature documentary, Endeavor, and in today's episode, I have the three women that I've just talked about and Mark Smolowitz, the film's producer. But without further delay, let's take a look at the trailer of Surviving the Silence. When Pat came over, I thought she seems nice. I'll find out who this person is. I don't know if I even heard about being connected to the military. I'm not really sure when you told me, but it wasn't something that I could understand how the impact would happen. We both were resigned to the fact that we couldn't be out and that we had to really protect ourselves. I was able to build a secret passageway that went from our bedroom and the bedroom that was supposed to be my bedroom. We felt that we had to be closeted in our own home. I had a lot of anger about that. And it wasn't only our society, but it was the fact that Pat was in the military. I was asked 
to be the first Army National Guard chief nurse. That really rocked my world because I had no idea how I would continue on in this relationship with that long distance. But I knew I had to go. It was the top rung of my career ladder. When I got to the Pentagon, we frequently could not talk. We had to develop a code so that we could communicate when we thought lines were tapped. You were absolutely right when you were talking about the military. We just hate this oppression. It's hard for both of us. I love you for all of the tolerance that you exhibit. I get this huge cardboard box and I started looking in it and I said, Oh no, I can't do this to her. I applied for a top secret clearance. I made the statement, I am a lesbian. I said, the army is going to start discharge proceedings against you. And I was stunned, embarrassed, hurt. I had always believed that the army took care of its own. And now they were coming after me. I'm sad that I had to be a part of that. Sorry that I had to do that to you. I wasn't ready to come out until now. Please welcome Pat Thompson. And I'll be back with these amazing women after this. You're with me, it's all right. Together, all our lives, a new star is inside. We're falling, it feels right. It's okay to hold me. I love it when I can see people backstage dancing to my theme song, but I'm not going to leave them backstage any longer. Let me welcome to the show Barbara Brass and Colonel Pat Thompson, also director, writer, and producer of the documentary Cindy Abel, and producer Mark Smolowitz. Welcome, everybody. Thank you. Great to be here. Um, I saw the film this afternoon and I was completely moved and honored and I, I want to make uh, our ladies of honor a big screen to tell you from the bo bottom of my heart um, and this will this is not a joke but it's an inside uh, statement for people uh, that um, have seen the documentary to both of you I just want to say it's 555. Yeah. Totally. It it will be 555 all the time forever between me and the two of you. So, congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Um 
uh, I'll actually leave you two in the spotlight for just a little while before I enter, bring Cindy and uh, Mark into the uh, conversation more. Um, Pat, uh, may I call you Pat? Yes. Thank you. Um, uh, what was it? Uh, one of the things we learn in the documentary is that basically you came out at the age of 70 to your family. Is that accurate? 80. 80? Counting. Yeah, it was actually 80. You were 80 years old when you came out to your family. Yes. And what year was that? Uh, almost seven years ago. When okay. So, well, with that additional information, you look marvelous. <laughs> um, but what was it that, because you by that point you had retired, you had gotten married, right? Yes. So what was it that had kept you still from making that decision, that if, you, if you know? As to why I made the decision? As, as to, no, as to why you hadn't yet. After, oh. everything, after everything was secure, your, your retirement was secure, your marriage was secure, uh, what was it that, in, that, that kept you from doing it sooner, and what was a turning point for you in actually deciding to do it? Well, the reason I had not done it before was because the little town where I was raised, where I lived uh, until I left at about age 20, um, was very uh, anti-gay. There were a lot of churches there, and they, uh, the one that my family attended, anti-gay, and uh, most all the others are anti-gay and so I did not want to do that to my family. I didn't want to upset them uh, by telling them who I was and when I was 80 uh, we were doing you know doing the film and we were also writing a book and I thought well I have to come out to the family because of the film and the book so that's what made uh, caused me to do that, but gave me the incentive. Well, and we learn in the documentary uh, briefly that at least some of them were supportive. I imagine they all were. Well, the younger ones, I think, uh, had talked a lot about me, and they were not surprised. My parents were no longer with us, uh, but the family that was there uh, were very receptive, and as I talk to them, I thought I would be nervous, but I wasn't. I could just feel the pressure leaving my body, you know, uh, because they were so receptive. I want to add in that one uh, nephew of Pat's, who is about my age, had written her this almost a love letter shortly before that happened, and he just adored her. And after he found out that she was a lesbian, he cut her off like an instant. In an instant. He wouldn't see her anymore, wouldn't respond to her anymore, wouldn't talk to her anymore. Uh, and she sent him a couple of books about uh, the religion and being gay and all of that. And, he's, and that's been, what, almost eight, six or seven years, maybe that length of time, that he has pretty much not had any contact with her and he was in love with her prior to that. So that tells I, you how evil this religion is. I, very religious. Well, I am sorry for that loss, um, but I'm grateful that for the most part, your family was so supportive. Mm -hmm. um, Barbara, one of the things that really moved me about your particular uh, one of the things you say in the film that really moved me is that I've waited my whole life for this. What did you wait your whole life for? Uh, well, I, I realized that I needed to have a, a purpose-driven life and not just one of those, oh, well, kick along and whatever comes along, comes along and just, or pick a, a, a career and, and have it be so-so. Um, I didn't have a focus on what it should be for me, but when I got involved as an activist, that I think was the most purpose-driven that I've ever felt, 
And it started quite a while back, little by little. And I let it continue and let it evolve and uh, took the opportunity when the election happened to start the Rat Pack, which is you see in the film, the Resistance Action Tuesdays and Thursdays. And I definitely thought that that for me was what I needed to be doing, what I've waited my life for, because it had, uh, a, it, well, now I know it has a legacy. I found out just recently with COVID it has a legacy. Uh, Pat and I stopped doing the out out of the house after the pandemic started. We are locked in hermetically sealed essentially here in our house. And um, so after a couple of weeks, the some of the people in the Rat Pack sent me an email and said, would you please start promoting it again? Because some of us want to get out there. And they've been out there every week since. And this week is pretty big. There are more people getting involved. There are others who found out about it. And it's a prime location, so people are adding, uh, the numbers are growing again because of what's happening now with the election. So I feel that that was what I waited my life for and the continuation of that um, wherever it leads. But now I'm doing what I've always wanted to do. I'm doing my artwork. Well, that's beautiful. I just want to give a little bit of personal information for all of you. So. Around 1983, I was coming out. I was miserable in school. I decided to enlist in the Air Force. Uh, I scored very high on the entrance exams. I had some college behind me, so I would go in as an officer. And because of my aptitudes, I would be, have gone in for an extra year, and they would have uh, trained me to be a linguist. And in the last minute, I, for whatever reason, decided to be honest on the final paperwork and checked yes to the, do you have any homosexual tendencies? And uh, I'm glad that I did that, but of course it changed the course of my future. And that was in 1983. Um, that sort of cues up what I wanna ask you, Cindy. Um, uh, you have been out for quite a while and, and uh, and an activist for quite a while. And I'm curious if you would sort of talk about the time in which you came out and your awareness of the Kamemeyer story when it happened. Sort of tell us what was going on in your life when that story hit the national news. In 1992, I was still pretty much closeted. You know, I had a small group of LGBT friends and some straight friends who were also, you know, very supportive. But I wasn't out, I wasn't active until the very end of 1992. And Bill Clinton was running and that was the first time I ever voted. Because I thought, you know, this guy isn't the, you know, silver spoon elite born and bred. He had to work hard. Maybe he will understand what it's like to be a regular person. And that really launched everything for me. And so I decided to come out. I was at a point where I thought, you know, I don't care if I have to pump gas for a living. I'm not ever gonna lie about who I am again unless my or the personal safety of those around me is in jeopardy. And that was really the beginning of how I chose to live my life. And it was kind of funny because one day, I was marching with some friends protesting um, the U.S. engagement in the Middle East. And four weeks later, I was carrying a lift the ban um, at a LGBT pride parade in Orlando. And so things just started accelerating from there. And the rest is history and we continue to make it. So, Mark, I want to pose the same question to you. Do you remember what you were doing in your life at the time that the Kamemeyer story broke open? Absolutely. Um, so I was out, you know, relatively young. Um, you know, I'm, I'm 51 and I, I came out in 1989. Um, and I came out right into sort of the heat of the AIDS crisis and, you know, I was living in San Francisco. I became quickly politicized as an activist. I was involved in ACT UP. I was involved in Fear Nation. And and both of those involvements, you know, had me, you know, on the streets, making noise, getting arrested, doing civil disobedience, you know, all of the above. Um, and I remember I remember very clearly the entire Greta Kamemeyer story. Um, and 
it's interesting, you know, to build on what Cindy was saying about Bill Clinton's candidacy. Um, I was, I actually, um, many of your uh, viewers and certainly um, Cindy and Barb, Barb and Pat will know this. So you all remember Roberta Ackenberg, right? Roberta Ackenberg was an out lesbian. She was an elected official in San Francisco. She was, um, she and Carol Megan were both elected to the Board of Supervisors in San Francisco in 1990. And I remember when they won and she became quickly a national figure. And she scaled up to be a part of Putin's campaign and she was advising him in 1992 on the sort of, you know, what we then called the gay and lesbian strategy. And um, through network involved in activism in San Francisco, I actually was invited by Roberta Ackenberg to appear in a video that was about getting younger gay and lesbian people around the country to vote for Bill Clinton in 1992. And that was a video that got circulated in the bars all over the country. And it would be like, this is the, the time that we were living in. It's all pre digital, right? There were VHS cassettes that were sent everywhere. Um, so when Clinton became president and gays in the military was clearly one of the things that he was going to bring to the forefront, um, I remember having big conversations in the queer politics movement at the time, you know, like, did we want to get on board with gays in the military? Was that an important cause for, for you know, queer nation? And I think that for myself, I, I sort of had an early understanding that these kinds of tentpole institutions like the military were absolutely essential places and spaces where we had to feel like we belonged. Um, even if military service was not something that I would choose for myself, you know, it had to be um, accepted and supported that we belonged there because we were already there. And I had this early understanding that if we were already there in the closet, that we had a right to be there and be out of the closet. Um, and so when Greta Kammermeyer's, you know, sort of big story unfolded, um, it was definitely something that I supported, and I, you know, I, I found her story quite moving, quite inspiring, quite important, you know, quite historic. Um, and then eventually, flash forward a few more years, and I, and this is my strange amorphous connection to Barb and Pat, in that there, when the movie premiered, um, Serving in Silence, it premiered at the Castro Theater in the mid '90s, and it was a special event, and it was a big premiere. And I was in that audience. And little would you know that, you know, here we are all these years later and we would be coming together to make this movie that was sort of, you know, the continuation of that story. But um, I don't think that anyone realizes how important that movie was in the 90s. I mean, Serving in Silence, the fact that it was executive produced by Barbara Streisand, that it, that it was starring Glenn Close as Kammermeyer, this was huge in the 90s. This was the first of its kind mainstream television event. Now we're all over, you know, everywhere. And I cannot, I cannot tell you how much pride I felt knowing that this movie and this story had been embraced by Hollywood and was being put out in the way that it was. So yeah, it was a huge, a huge, a huge memory in the nineties. It, it is quite phenomenal. I, I mentioned at the top of the show that Notes from Hollywood started in 1990, and it, I started writing a column called Notes from Hollywood as part of my outreach uh, as a board member of the Alliance for Gay and Lesbian Artists in the Entertainment Industry. So that's mm -hmm. how Notes from Hollywood came about. And when Bill Clinton was elected, I was at the Hollywood Hills at the home of the late uh, Scott Hitt and his husband. Mm -hmm. uh, they weren't legally married at the time. Um, standing next to David Mixner when he was making a speech uh, that uh, Bill Clinton had won. So that was kind of where I was at that that point in history. Um, uh, Barbara and Pat, uh, what was it that inspired you to go and give that speech uh, that allowed Cindy to hear your story? And uh, at which you were met with such an amazing standing ovation. What was the impetus for that? Yeah, uh, well, the, the uh, organizer of this Day Pride Days at Sierra College was a professor who we know through our P Flag chapter. And he knew that we knew Carol Kalmeyer, so he asked if we could get a hold of her and ask her to speak as a keynote speaker for the Day Pride coming up. And we did, and she said she wasn't available. But during that time, I was thinking, yeah, everybody knows her, but 
people don't know this other story and people don't know how spouses, her spouse included, have to deal with having an LGBT military spouse. So I thought a panel of the four of us would be even better than just Colonel Kalmeyer speaking. And then when they couldn't make it, I, I figured that Pat and I could share our story of coming out in that venue to the public had no idea that it would go worldwide as it has now and we did what we did just because we felt we needed to share and that's the, the backstory and pat was still i think she still had some healing to do for the work that she did to dismiss colonel kalemeyer i think that 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 sharing it and getting the, the feedback from people and those young women coming up to us with tears in their eyes asking for autographs really had an impact in a, in a very positive way. So, so many different things for, from that one event had evolved. And mainly, I, I feel that if, if it made her feel more, uh, more healed from that, then, then it was worth every minute of it. Yeah, I just wanted to say that our friend, Susan Lewis helped us a lot with, uh, with writing us. So that was very helpful to us. And we had a lot of fun with preparing it as well because you can't see anything much in the film, but uh, I uh, pulled up a camouflage blanket and I was standing behind it. Pat was introduced and she came out on stage and she uh, spoke for a bit and then she introduced me and I came from the, behind that camouflage. So. The title of our speech was Invisible No More. I really like the way Cindy turned it into sur uh, surviving the silence to take uh, off on serving the silence. It was perfect to, to, to go that way. But it started as Invisible No More. Well, uh, that was brilliant on your part, Cindy. Uh, I'd love to know, Cindy and Mark, how, and you, one of you jump in, uh, this, uh, you win the prize if you do. Uh, how do you know each other? We actually met through Barb and Pat. Um, a friend of Mark's was at the same talk that I attended that Barb and Pat spoke at. And they knew, she knew Barb and Pat. And then Joni said, oh, I have a friend who's a filmmaker. I want to introduce you. Okay, great. And she connected me with Mark. And I guess Mark did some due diligence and found out I was for real. <laughs> and then we just connected and started working together off and on for a couple of years and then really in earnest for the last, what, two years, Mark? Yeah, yeah, it's been, I mean, it's been amazing. I mean, this is this is how it often happens in my work where, I mean, it literally was an email in my inbox one morning from a trusted friend and someone who I adore here in San Francisco. Her name is Joni Juster. Um, she's actually a straight ally and she's someone who has been walking the walk with the LGBT community, you know, for, for decades, you know, she's a major, major figure in the AIDS activist movement, you know, one of the sort of famous, um, you know, AIDS walk fundraisers, you know, she was a community grand marshal for SF Pride. And so, you know, if it comes from Joni, you know, it was sort of a trusted email in my inbox. Um, and then, you know, the process of getting to know Cindy was was gradual and sort of intentional. But I had an instinct that this was an interesting and important like way into really looking at Greta Kammermeyer's legacy from a totally different um, perspective, right? So, so early on, what struck me here was that, you know, that Barb and Pat's story was the story behind a story that people thought that they knew, the story of Greta Kammermeyer. But as someone who's been very interested in LGBT history, has made a lot of documentaries that sort of are in that category, you know, we are seeing that younger queer people are not aware of their history, right? And, you know, history is so often for queer people, it's, you know, it's Stonewall, it's the AIDS crisis, and it's gay marriage, you know? And, and, it, and a lot of the sort of, you know, in-between narratives or the lesser known figures are not getting the recognition or certainly not getting the visibility. And even though Greta Kammermeyer is so important, so few people even know her, right? And so this it felt like an opportunity to reintroduce her, but do it in, do it through the lens of this beautiful love story that people don't expect, right? And then the other piece that really struck me as powerful was the idea of doing a movie that is that is a beautiful story about older queer women who were coming out late in life and becoming out and proud late in life and then emerging as role models at that time of their lives. There's so few good movies about older queer women. And so I just saw so many opportunities 
to kind of differentiate this project in ways that were important and powerful and could be exciting. And Cindy's vision for this story was always so clear and so strong from the get-go. And I mean, and I, I say this in front of all of you, and Cindy, you're here and I want to compliment you. <laughs> You know, the conversations that Cindy and I had as far back as 2014 and 2015 are as consistent to the to today, you know, that her she knew what story she wanted to tell. She knew that she wanted to focus in on the love story, on the relationship between Barb and Pat, and, and every machination of how this movie has gone from script to screen, so to speak, has been just a delight for me. Um, and it, 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 the results are apparent in when you sit and watch the documentary. Cindy's vision is clear. The story is so beautifully told. Um, you know, I, one of my favorite things that Cindy came up with along the way are the animation sequences, which are was such a beautiful way of bringing to life some of these special backstory elements that you can't, you know, instead of leaning heavily on reenactment, which we have a little bit of, you know, Cindy fell in love with this idea of animation, and it's so beautiful, hand-drawn, elegant, just like Barb and Pat and Greta, and they each have an animation story that is theirs, and there's just all these wonderful things in the film that I feel like make it so poignant and so immersive and so intimate. That's I, I'm I'm in love with this movie, and I have a hashtag. It's hashtag proud producer on this one, and I and I am big time hashtag proud producer. Well, and and so you sh and so you should be. You know, I describe notes from Hollywood as being about people passionately pursuing professions in the entertainment industry, and that would apply to the filmmakers on the interview today. But when it comes to documentaries and and uh, and especially this one, it's just really about people deciding to express and honor their life force and to see mm -hmm. what happens when people do that. And that's been a long time theme of my life. And to Barbara and Pat, I just want to say that um, even though your story is about older lesbians, as um, someone that's a little bit younger than at least one of you, um, I am inspired by the fact that some of the most brilliant, beautiful, transformative moments of your life happened at an age that's older than I am now. It just gives me hope because I feel like in coming out at such an early age, I sacrificed a sort of path that would have given me a different type of success earlier in life. And I'm grateful that my willingness to follow my own instincts all this time is going to end up at this big, fabulous destination. And I have to say one of my great honors in my decades of multimedia activism is sharing a screen with the two of you, mm -hmm. literally, to, that this, this screen is part of history, that I get mm -hmm. to be on camera helping to amplify your story as Mark and Cindy have as well. How must it be for the two of you to get feedback just like that, that people are so honored to even share your space? We had a lot of great feedback so since we've been doing Q and A's, you know, for the different film festivals. Uh, a lot of our friends, you know, go to Facebook and and, and get so many emails. So you know, it just warms my heart. <laughs> um, I I try to monitor what does come through on Facebook um, because I do that. Pat does it and. And I'm so grateful that Cindy has taken up the ones who get a little uh, gnarly with, with whatever they're thinking. Uh, and she'll give them the right answer. And I'm not at all interested in trying to deal with that. I'm not into taking care of any confrontation that way if I don't have to. Uh, I think I did enough on the street with the Proud Boys a couple of years ago, and I'm tired of that. I'm not into confrontation. But as Pat said, we have gotten almost nothing but positive response and, and really love, uh, people love what they're seeing. I love the film, the, the quality of the film. You know, it's so funny. When we saw the film for the first time, we, we showed it to my mother, my sister, and uh, my both, both my sisters and my brother-in-law. And one of my sisters is like the super activist. She's uh, a straight ally she is involved in everything politically as well as lgbt and she said this is just wonderful 
And my other sister is very kind of low-key. And she said, it's so professionally done. <laughs> but it's interesting that the, the response is so different and they'll probably watch this and they'll see that what, what i'm saying but it's so true it's exactly what it was and, and that's what happens with people in our in our circle of friends and acquaintances that kind of response some people are just well i i tried to watch it but i couldn't i didn't have time to see it and they, these people have known us for a while and oh well, I know it was playing again. I got a ticket, but I it, the time ran out. I didn't get to see it. And these are people who have been saying, "When will this film come out? When will it come out?" So I have a lot of um, ooh, uh, uh, I'm trying to be calm about it. Why? Why do you not have one hour and fifteen minutes in your such busy life in COVID restriction and lockdown that you cannot find the time? three times in California to see this film that you've been clamoring for for years. So I'm, you know. Um, I have some live remarks that have come in. I, I believe that at least one of you know this person. And I don't know when Julie, what she, Julie was referring to with, yes, you did. But um, Julie also asked, I know how much work you all put into fundraising to make this happen. Other than that, what was the hardest part of making all this happen? I guess that goes to Mark and Cindy. The hardest Cindy. part is the part that we're going through right now. At least from my from my perspective, I'll let you know Mark chime in as well. But that is the part where we go from film festivals, which we're are, we are at right now, and we're in over twenty so far on four out of three continents, which is fantastic. Uh, and then to go to the next step, which is distribution. Now we're in conversations with a couple of different distributors and we want to make the best possible decision. And it's the lack, it's needing the connections and the visibility that will help us get to that next level. You know, because if we had a big name that was an executive producer on this, for example, then that would change the nature of the conversation. And so this is only my second film, um, which was why it was so important to me to have Mark working on this, especially at this particular part, not only in shaping the story, but especially using his, what, 30 some years of making successful films to help us get to that next level. So that for me is at this moment, at least the definitely the hardest part. The rest, you know, yes, fundraising is hard. Everybody you know, slogs through the muddy snow in order to raise what we need to raise to either elect a president or a governor or a city council member or make a movie. But, you know, the filming of it itself and, and crafting the story, that's the beauty and that's the joy. And that's what I always come back to. And doing these interviews is very um, life-giving because it allows me to reflect on why are we doing these things? Why are we you know, doing outreach? Why are we you know, marketing? Why do we have Danielle doing all this awesome social media? It's because there's this story and you really tapped into it. You know, and there's a whole team. Mark very generously gave credit to me for doing the, uh, having the idea to do the animations that actually goes to our DP and editor, Michael Bruno, a young straight white ally who is very much behind all of this and has been my film partner in this and in breaking through my first film. But it's like, you know, so there's a whole team of people who have given so much to make this happen. And now we're in that final stage. And so that's where, yes, it's hardest, I guess, at the end of the marathon. And yet we know that there will be an end to this marathon. And so we continue on and we, you know, thank you for having us, Nicholas, because it reminds me of the importance of what it is that we're doing. You know, whenever we're at a film festival, like we were at, in San Diego at the San Diego International Film Festival, the only LGBT related story, at least in the documentary space at that entire festival. And we got such great feedback and such response. And this is where we're helping to really touch hearts and to change minds. And this is, first and foremost, why we made this movie. 
and why we want distribution so we can get it out so everyone can hear about the integrity and the courage and the commitment to each other and to their country that Barb and Pat showed for all this time and for so long of that time of showing it from being in the closet, you know, working behind the scenes, doing what it took in order to take responsibility for what's happening in our world. And I want everyone to see this. I want them, you know, you saw the movie and you had me in tears the way you were falling in love with it, you know, and it's like 555 has not looked the same for me in the last five years. So I'm sure. Well, you know, uh, I didn't see the movie in a theater, but I have a 65 inch 4K television uh. with surround sound and the television is no more than eight feet from me. So I have a movie theater experience when I'm watching it and I'm watching your movie on the same system that I use to watch movies on HBO and your movie would look great on HBO, <laughs> and it would fit very well on HBO, unless Netflix gets to you first. Um, but let me tell you, it, it certainly is worthy of that uh, level of notoriety and distribution and attention. Mark, what would you like to add? Um, thank you. You know, I just to build a little bit on that, so, you know, this this movie, like so many movies this year, you know, has been impacted by the COVID pandemic, right? So, so the larger film and entertainment industry has been upended, right? Film festivals were canceled and went virtual. Um, there's a huge backlog of content that is undistributed, and you know, the, we're sort of in that weird zone where we have this beautiful movie that is officially undistributed, meaning you know, we, we have all the rights. We get to control the journey. Cindy got to deliver the creative vision that she wanted to deliver on screen. And now we have to sell it, right? The act of selling a movie is a huge lift, even in the best of conditions, right? Add in the pandemic, and it's a huge challenge. So I am here to remind Cindy and remind other independent filmmakers that slow, it, it's a slow and steady wins the race approach to selling the movie. And this film, in my estimation, has had an exceedingly successful year, okay? We, came, we world premiered on June 1st, and we've been in, what is it now? We're on our 20th festival. We are darling in the virtual festival landscape. Um, our three stars, Greta and Barbara and Pat, have been on virtual Q&As across the globe. People are gobbling this up in a beautiful way that is, shows me that this thing has shelf life it has staying power um you know not to be a spoiler but the movie ends and it had sort of like you know it has like sort of a specific ending that is related to a certain president that we're you know contemplating either re-electing or not re-electing next week <laughs> and i think that the coda for this movie you know will be that you know hopefully it works out in our favor next week and the movie will still matter because guess what LGBT representation in the, in the military still matters. Transgender representation in the military is a hot button issue in, in the current moment. And this movie really reminds us of that. And so I think 2021 will be a decisive year for surviving the silence. I'm confident that we will land somewhere where we will meet a large national, if not worldwide audience. It just takes time. It's just a you know, slow and steady wins the race, and we're and we're having those kinds of milestones as we as we work together. Um, we're you know you, you have these moments where you suddenly have an inquiry from someone who really is influential who can open a door. Um, and I guess one last comment is I'll say that December of you know which is right around the corner is the tenth anniversary of the repeal of Don't Ask Don't Tell. So we are working towards, and Cindy can comment on this further, you know, really having a moment of visibility for the film and in conjunction with that anniversary. So anniversaries actually provide an opportunity for public conversation and for a chance to advance the message. And I think that this movie will, will have a nice moment in the first half of December in conjunction with that anniversary. So we're taking well, down all those opportunities. Take it away, Cindy. He set you up. <laughs> well, I do, and I agree. You know, I think that having this anniversary is so key because it reminds us that it was only 10 years ago, which is not that long in a political lifespan, only 10 exactly. years ago that LG, well, 
L and G service members could not serve openly. Notice uh, the B, bisexuals were never mentioned. It was just gays and lesbians or homosexuality. And then um, at the end of the Obama administration, thanks to the 22nd Army Secretary, Eric Fanning, who's also in our film, played a pivotal role in for making sure that transgender members could also serve openly. And then we saw a couple of years ago that that got repealed with the tweet. And so now it's a strange place. And as we move forward, you know, things will be very different one month from now. It'll either be way better or way worse, is, you know. But here we are, we're, we're really on the verge of a historic election. Our country's gonna take a hard turn in one direction or the other. And I think this film can help humanize one more, one more segment of society, if you will, that is frankly under attack right now. You know, we've seen a rise in hate crimes against LGBTQ folks, particularly against trans women and trans women of color. That doesn't just go away if, uh, you know, we have a President Biden. We have a culture that continues to need to be educated and to bring our very human stories to the forefront so people can go, huh, I never thought of it that way. I didn't realize you know, one of the comments we got after one of our film festivals was from a straight person who said, I was in tears watching this. This was from a PFLAG member. I was in tears watching this because I never really thought about what we were asking people when we asked them to just simply not tell the truth about who they were. Don't ask, don't tell was such a horrible, horrible compromise. And that it can barely be called a compromise, frankly, but it's what was needed to then take the next step. And I think that's where we are right now. And this film has such a role to play as we move forward to, you know, touch hearts. We were talking before about serving in silence and Colonel Gre Greta Kammermeyer. Now, my background, my parents were for all my childhood and much of my adult life, fundamentalist Christian missionaries. And when Serving in Silence came out, I begged my mother to please watch this on television. Now we're talking to, you know, a, a woman who doesn't watch a whole lot on television. And yet she did. And at the end of it, you know, we had a conversation on the phone and she said, you know, I still don't think it's right based on the Bible, but no one should get fired from their jobs, including the military, because they're gay. And so, that was just such a, a, a door opening for my mom and I to have a very different conversation than the one that we had had before. And I envision this film having that same impact and hopefully, you know, spreading out just as far. Well, I do too. And I, I definitely, I don't have a rating system, but I give it two thumbs up uh, um, from the bottom of my heart. Uh, I just wanted to acknowledge uh, one of the unanswered questions relating to what I've shared with you. So why did I come out when I came out? <clears throat> Excuse me. I was seeing people that I knew dying and I was majoring in communication at Arizona State University. And I realized that the most powerful thing I had was the ability to tell my own truth and to put my own name and face and story in the game. And I also felt like I didn't have any guarantee that I had gonna, was going to be around for very long based upon what was happening around me. And I felt this sort of desperation to make my life have some sort of meaning in the midst of it all. So that was that was my catalyst. But one of the things that's clear to me, and, and Cindy will know this because of our mutual work and uh, in an organization called The Experience, which is a whole other show. Um, when we come out, when we express our truth, we put our whole world into their own process around that issue. And the reason that we live in such a different world today is because so many of us have done that. Um, I want to ask one more direct question, and then I want each of you to have the opportunity to add anything you feel has been missed in our interview. And I'm going to save Barbara and Pat for last in terms of that big piece. Is there anything we've missed? Um, but uh, you, uh, Cindy, mentioned what's going on this weekend. For point of reference, it's October 28th, 2020. 
for people that want to know the historic the history behind this if they watch this in the future it's like yes as much as we fought and as much progress we've made who would have thought that in 2020 so much of our life liberties and the pursuit of happiness would be in such danger whoever would have thought and it's the context in which mm -hmm. your movie is coming out is sort of unbelievable we we might have taken these things for granted five years ago under the obama administration with the white house written up and uh, lit up in rainbow colors and you know marriage equality celebrating being celebrations happening everywhere so um my specific question and and uh, i'll go to barbara and pat first um, how are you, how are you feeling uh, at this point in history uh, about what's going on in the world? Well, I will say um, definitely what Mark was saying about if we have the right election happening, which means Biden Harris will be our next president and vice president. We still have the most evil looking SCOTUS. Uh, Supreme Court with Amy Coney Barrett. I'm sorry, Coney Barrett, whatever. She, uh, she, she has made, if she sees this movie, if it could have an impact on somebody like her and the others in the court who would, without a doubt, want to take all the rights away that we bled and fought and died for over the years, uh, I would love that. I mean, I would love that because that is really what it is, what you were just talking about, making an impact, changing hearts and changing minds and, and all of those things happening. So I think that we need to get this new film out everywhere, everywhere, even more so now than before. And I am glad that we are where we are with it so that we can put it around the, the country and the world. And I do the best I can to promote it to everybody. I'll, I'll stop grumbling about those who can't find a way to see it. But they will see it. They will see it. And everybody, and the, the people who see it mostly are the ones who are our allies anyway, our friends, um, people who are LGBTQ, um, people who are open-minded and caring. But the ones who do need to see it are right there in the Supreme Court. And well, when it's when it's on HBO, you never know who's going to see it, right? Exactly. exactly. Yeah. Uh, I, I like to dream big myself. So, uh, Mark, what would you like to add uh, to my question about what's going on in the world today and your film coming out in this context? And then throw in the answer to the question. Is there anything else you want to make sure it gets into the interview? Yes. Well, first of all, thank you so much for this wonderful opportunity tonight, Nicholas. Um, I really enjoyed being a part of this discussion. You know, this is a very difficult moment in the world. You know, I mean, 2020 is by far, you know, the most turbulent year, you know, of my lifetime. I was born in 1968, which was the most turbulent year of the last century. And here we are in the most turbulent year of this century. Um, the protests and the pandemic um, are, are sort of bookends of our experience this year. Um, you know, and the most vulnerable among us are suffering, you know, you know, through it all, right? And so there's there's no there's no way of seeing our movie and the sort of story that it's trying to share with the larger world without seeing it against that backdrop. Um, there is a real, real darkness over the nation, if not the planet. Um, and you know, but yet we lean into hope. Yet we lean into inspiration. Yet we lean into stories that 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 show us that people can late in life, you know, have that epiphany where they, you know, suddenly come out of the closet and are out and proud and activists and see their place in the world as role models, right? So I think that, you know, I'm not throwing in the towel here, you know, um, the, we make, you know, the, the battle around the Supreme Court is bigger than this conversation, obviously, right? Um, I put a post on Facebook on, on the night that it happened and, um, and it, it said something like, um, this is 50 years in the making, you know, this is a, the Republican and evangelical culture war 50 years in the making, and it all culminates tonight in the Supreme Court. Now the gloves have to come off, okay? So this has not been happening overnight. This is a five decade story. You know, they they got in there and they now they have their 6-3 majority. Well, you know what? We have to show up and show out next week. And, you know, 
get you know let's take take back the presidency the vice presidency the congress the, the house of representatives and the senate and maybe we can see some change on from our side you know and, and until the last vote is counted we all have to hope for that work for that and and people are doing remarkable things right now to help make sure that happens right and i think we i think it's clear you know i mean but the, the country is 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 stuck in this gross divide it's incredibly stressful it's incredibly dark but there's still so much good work being done everywhere. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful. I remain hopeful. Um, the thing that I will say about that I want to chime in one last thing about this movie is I want to just highlight um, Barb and Pat once again. And there's something, so Cindy started this project, you know, six years ago. Um, there's some very early footage. It's even in the trailer that you showed tonight where the two of them are interviewed on the couch in their house. And it's very early footage. It's not long after they came out. And you can sort of hear in their voice, there's still some fear, there's still some trepidation, there's still some hesitation. And I have watched these two women over the last six years go on a remarkable journey where they have not only come out and become activists, but the, the election of Trump fuel their activism to new heights that are would inspire anyone okay and the, and we've seen that transformation in both of you it has been such a joy to be the producer on this movie because i've gotten to know you and be a witness to the beauty that has come forth in your spirit and your lives as activists you are such amazing women such inspirations and th this has been a huge highlight of of the, the, just getting to know you and being a witness to that. Um, and we see it happen in the film. That's the, that's the magic of documentary. It may have taken six years to make this thing, but the longitudinal aspects of that are what give you this incredible portrait of these two women. And here we are in 2020 and it's better than ever for them. So I think it's, it's, really, it's really something to celebrate. Well, and Barbara waited her whole life for this. I'm going to come back to Barbara and Pat for final words. Cindy, what would you like to add to the interview that we haven't addressed or that you want to emphasize? Sure. You know, we sometimes think that we're powerless. It, some people even will say, oh, you know, what's the point of voting? What's one vote matter? Well, we know better than that. And yet when we look at what, Colonel Patsy Thompson did from inside the closet. What she did helped ensure that Colonel Greta Kamemeyer could get reinstated in federal court, which then played a huge role in eventually undoing Don't Ask, Don't Tell. That started with Colonel Patsy Thompson. According to Colonel Greta Kamemeyer and her attorney, Mary Newcomb, both of them say, Without Pat, we would have had a very, very different outcome. So Pat did the hardest thing and the most painful thing, and it was the best thing. And Congressman John Lewis from my state here in Georgia used to say, you have to make a way out of no way. And that's exactly what Pat did. And so it's such an honor to be able to share this story, her story, the story of Barb, who was willing to say, okay, I'll wait a little bit longer because I love this woman. And her love for Pat was so fierce. She never resented her. She resented the military. She resented the government and the society that they were living in, but she never resented the woman she loved, even though she put her aspirations on hold for quite a while. And so to me, there's integrity and there's love and there's fierce love. And we see how they are still committed to fulfilling the promise of America. And every action that we take, no matter how small it may seem at the time, has an impact and it ripples out. And so we see this quiet behind the scenes action. We now get to celebrate next month 10 years of repealing a horrible policy because of what she and others like her did. And that is such a perfect example of how we each can play a difference in our world. 
And so now we find ourselves here. And I would ask everyone who can to come out as an LGBTQ plus person and as an ally of not only our community, but of community of folks who are striving and working and persevering in hopes of someday having full equality. And if you can't come out, work on it, take another step in that direction. And in the meantime, try to make a way where there is no way. So you can look back and say, you know what? I did everything I could to help make America live up to her ideals. Because as you see in the film, Colonel Thompson says, I love this country. And she was willing to sacrifice her life for a country that did not want her and would not have wanted her if they had known all of who she was. And I think this is the moment in history that we're all called to. And if we just rise up however we can, we can have an impact in turning the tide and restoring the equality that we once thought we had and we can solidify it. So we don't have to keep doing this every four years. So Barb and Pat, you are my heroes. I'm so, so honored that you allowed us to make this story. And Nicholas, thank you for being such a huge part of sharing this story. Because well, you are helping do what Mark and I have dreamed of doing for the last six years. Well, I'm, I'm very much honored to share the screen with all of you. And, you know, one of the things that, that's been clear to me for decades is that, you know, one day none of us will be here, but all of us leave a legacy. And the size of that legacy is directly tied to our personal choices, our actions, the expression of our own life force. And with that, I'm going to bring Barbara and Pat full screen to just say whatever you want to say uh, in conclusion. And I invite all of you to stick around after the show for just a couple of minutes if you want to debrief. Um, but in the in the uh, but before we do that, um, Barbara and Pat, I'm just so honored again that you're here and I'd love for you to add anything you would like to to the interview. And uh, I just want to actually add one more comment. A very touching story. Tears just dropped while listening, and RJ is a regular viewer from the Philippines. Wow. So please take it away, Barbara and Pat, and I'm going to make you full screen for this. Thank you. And uh, thank you, Mark, and Cindy, for all your kind words. I appreciate that. It has been such an honor to be part of this film. Um, Required a lot of time, a lot of work, and it was just so exciting. And we love every minute of it. And we loved the film. When we saw the, the finished film, we were so impressed with the job that Cindy had done. Uh, so I just want to say to everybody out there, there are a lot of people, a lot of nurses, a lot of women have similar stories and so for that reason I was happy to be able to tell my story uh, because of so many people that I know that can relate to my story and um, I just want to say one thing that I will do for you that really touched my heart and it was written by uh, Senator Cory Booker. Hope over fear and love over hate. And I'll end with that. And I wanted to also add, uh, just to, to say exactly what she said to thank everybody who had a part in putting this together tonight, as well as our film and Mark and Cindy. And Michael and Jesse and uh, just it, it's been an experience of a lifetime. Uh, I wouldn't change anything at all along the way. Uh, maybe outside of our filming, but not but from the film process and the people involved. And I do want to leave everybody out there who's watching with one final word of my call to action. And 
this is going to be it. <laughs> vote, <laughs> vote, vote, vote. We we definitely see that. <laughs> okay. Yay! You got it. Um, I, I voted weeks ago and, and yes, everyone needs to vote. Uh, well, from the bottom of my heart, thank all of you. And, uh, from me to all of you, it's 555. Okay. 555. Yes. And for everyone at home, thank you for watching and I'll see you next time. Yes. You're with me. It's all right. Together, all our lives, a new star is inside.